Yes. Yes, man. Right. Yeah. Uh, Dale Wild, how many years has it been since we had a beer together? Did you go to Waldo's wedding? I didn't, mate, no. No. Oh, fucking hell. No. Fuck, still, fuck we were in prick, then. Fucking prick didn't invite me, did he? <laughs> did he not? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> how did I, how did I, hang on a minute. How did I get an invite then? Because I'm not as close to him as you guys were. Right? Yeah, you probably gate crushed it. Slag him up. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Cheers, mate. No worries. No, it's been... Um... That was a funny wedding. Have you heard the story? Have you heard the Stu Pearson incident? No. <laughs> <laughs> Stu Pearson was... Start staying. laughing already. <laughs> Stu Pearson was staying at the... Pull that, pull that chair forward for me. Just for the, for the camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, Formal. Trying to get away from me, mate. He's got an hour and a half now. No, seriously, I'm going to kiss you in a minute. <laughs> um, so Stu Pearson was staying at the hotel. And uh, and someone got all of his room room number. And then everyone just started piling all the drinks at the bar <laughs> on his room. <laughs> he went... He went mental but in, in true stew fashion mate wouldn't let it drop this is the reception of the wedding and he comes bowling at the bar oh that fucking causing a massive <laughs> drama wouldn't let it drop I think I think it was it was um is it you? Ralph it was me what's that Ralph who did the cowboy stuff does the cowboy stuff Ralph yeah Ralph the fuck are you on about? Is he, there's, a, there's a guy, a lad called Ralph. I, mate, you're a fucking amateur, are you? Yeah, I've done podcasts before. You're on about? Yeah. There you go, in front of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be now. <laughs> um, right, pick. Ralph. <clears throat> Ralph, tree par lad. Flipping. Went out, took it, went out to America and started doing, um, like exams and being a, being, um, a rancher and all that. <laughs> Do you not know about this? <laughs> yes. That's fucking Ralph. mental. Yeah, I'm sure, his, I'm sure his name is Ralph. Yeah. And he's, he'd be back, he'd be in his bunk, mate, and Carl, he was practicing lassoes and that. Like you do. Anyway, yeah. so I think it was him. That's the stupidest thing at Waldo's wedding. Yeah. Yeah, but then he should have lassoed Stu, shouldn't he? Yeah, should have lassoed Dragged him out. Yeah, yeah, yeah Stu fucking mental. Bless him. I think it was a few hundred quid as well. <laughs> He's tighter than a duck's ass. Yeah, Stu's a proper pad, isn't he? Oh, mate. Mm. Mm. No, nice beer, though. We've, we've it's a uh, Spitfire. It's, it's not mm. local. It's just like a kind of thing. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, it's Kentish. Kentish Hill. Um, oh. When did you get out? Uh, June 2007. <coughs> ah, yes. Mm. How come? Um, If I'm being honest. I remember, though, no, that, sorry, that year, loads of good blokes went. You're not including that list, mine, but the other people that left, they oh, were good guys. <laughs> <laughs> not me and Carl actually got on the same day. Yeah. Oh, you really? Sh- should have seen Bossy's face when we both signed <laughs> off together before after, and he's a bit like, what? Um, it, I always had the sort of um, outlook, you know, like when you were a young Tom and Lance Jack, you're just sort of saying silly streets for like hats, chicks and Frenchmen kind of thing. Um, and I just started seeing a fucking bird. I don't even know how it ended up. And then you start going out more, going home more. And uh, if I'm being honest, you start to think like you're missing sort of life and Civvy Street. So I just thought, fuck this, I'm signing off, I'm going. And yeah, regretted it about about two hours after. <laughs> <laughs> like the services on the motorway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just get some, like get some mortgage. And then my dad's like, oh, you have to stand on your own two feet now, lad. And I was, oh yeah, fuck it, whatever. And then all the bills start coming and you're going, fuck, Civvy Street's hard. I didn't really have a, did resettlement and that. Um, didn't really have a, a massive plan as such um just thought you know play it play it as it went really yeah it is it is a it is a it is a shock it's like um it depends on what stage you got in as well i mean you get people you think about those lads and girls who join up sort of afc the foundation college at 16 Mm -hmm. they've never had to stand their own two feet that's what i did oh really there you go first ever intake so you get in everything's sorted for you with the army everything is sorted because at that time you didn't have to pay for your meals you got taken out you've uh, paid didn't it so he just he doesn't have to do anything he just had to exist to keep breathing yeah. and keep fit and then uh, yeah then like 10-15 years later you get out and you go whoa it's, it's fr- if you're being honest it's pretty f- frightening because you have the reg mentality I can do anything can do whatever I want to do go out don't give a fuck and then when actually the reality starts hitting your door of all the bills you have to pay and I, but I do genuinely think like the army fails in that in that department of giving you real life skills or real financial skills. Because if someone said to me, like when I was 16, save 20% of your way, save 10% of your way, you never know when you're going to need it. You're just like, oh, you fuck off, I'm a rock yeah. star, it's payday, see you later. Or save it for you. Or yeah. save it for you. Yeah, Don't do it for choice. you. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned that, right? Because that's the second, only the second time I've heard someone 
say about the uh, uh, the army all the forces should give more should take more responsibility for preparing you for civvy street with the life skills and particularly like the financial yeah. side it was nick mccarthy you know nick no, he, he, name rings a bell. He, he next two power patrols, he uh, got out and he established Argus Europe, a CP training company. Up yeah, and yeah, done. yeah. Right. So Nick was on a, f- a few weeks back, and he said he said it. He said he said they. One of the things he said is you should not be allowed to leave if you've got bad debt. Hundred percent should not be allowed to leave. You got bad debt. Yeah, comment. You, fair comment. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, part of the resettlement should be financial advice. He said platoon commanders, company commanders should that should be part of it with them because they they yeah. sort of more savvy with that kind of thing they've joined up later and they should yeah. be made to sit you down and as part of it right have you, you know have you done your settlement course da, 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 right what's your financial situation let's see how we can help you out with that and just mm. give advice you know yeah um, no yeah. I, I agree with that i always remember um back in the day when we when we come out of uh depot and into dover and i met uh emlyn hughes and he always used to say paratroops are just uh like the council estate trench circus and it, it always stuck in my head and I think because you Trench Circus. <laughs> trench Takers. Trench Takers. Yeah. <laughs> because that's what Pirates are. They so say, we ain't got anything between our ears, but we're all hard as fuck. And it just, it always just made me laugh, you know, we're, so, we're drinking in the platoon lines because we <clears throat> got made to drink. Um, and you look back on that now and it, it not so much the, the, as a direct sort of go at the blokes, but because we do all join so young, very few of us are from any type of affluent background. And then, you, obviously you start getting paid and you, you know you, when you get to battalion you're a tom so what you want to take on 1500 quid a month something like that. it's not a lot of money not even that, is it? Yeah. but it is when you've had no <laughs> you've had square at a cock all leading up to it and then you just get into that routine of going out on payday maybe going having a scoff at weather spoons and just getting on it until your money runs out you know it becomes i'll oh, spend it on kit i used to spend it on kit because it was just a fucking sex pest <laughs> and it's uh and then when you do come to civvy street you just think fucking hell i wish someone was gripped me you know, at some point, and it, it, you know, I've got to agree, it probably should start at like platoon commander level. Yeah. Um, even if they're not overly savvy themselves, at least have that direction within the sort of, within their own training. So, so you know, pass this down to the blokes. At least encourage some kind of financial sort of uh, independence, if you like, rather than relying on the, on the army to provide it for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I always when I got out, it was only when I got out that I envied those blokes that were in that was straight as fuck. Like, like you're saying, I was, I mean, it was years. It went yeah. on for years where I was skint by seventh, eighth of the month because of kit and on the piss. Yeah, yeah. And then I, and then you, you don't stop then though. You borrow, you borrow money until, yeah, you don't, yeah, yeah you go, yeah, yeah. Get, you're coming out, you, uh, oh, I'm fucking skint. I'll square you away the cash bit. Yeah, no worries. And then yeah. fucking, you know what it's like. And then when I got, and then you got, there's a lad. Do you remember Andy Bray? Yep. Andy Bray, straight as fuck. Um, Good lad, good lad in the piss, yeah. but he absolutely could turn around most of the time and go, nah, no, it's like skin. He was never skint. Yeah. He had a bank full of money. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but looking back, man, that is the way, to, that's the way to do it. Set yourself up. Yeah. You know? I think there's a happy medium, isn't there? That there's definitely got to be a happy medium. You've got to enjoy your time in the reg or in the army, whatever, whatever you're doing. But I think it's just, for me, it's the accountability and the, the realism that, you know, it's not going to last forever. Um, I was speaking to a bloke the other week, I won't mention his name. He, he's just done 22 years uh, in the Fusiliers. And he's sort of saying if, if he was, if he weren't going to be getting his sort of golden handshake and his pension, he goes, I wouldn't have a pot to piss in. He said, I'm always overdrawn. I'm always like two grand overdrawn. I'm like, yeah. fucking hell, man, you're 45. Uh, you, how does that happen? You, you could even, you could even do it as a, instead of just um, like a, a resettlement, a sort of end of career type of thing, it could even be something that in the interests of, being a more, in inverted commas, productive organisation with better welfare, happier, happier employees, soldiers, sailors, yeah. airmen. It could even be an ongoing programme of certain things, like financial side of things, financial management, fi- you know, yeah, money management. Yeah, of course you should. That you could just go on and do it once a month. Like, you know, you got to, like once, once every six months, you've got to go in and have your financial, uh, financial management uh, brief or whatever. And, yeah. You know, you have 10 or 15 of them over your, over your career in, you could be better off than not. You're less skint, so your employees, the British Army's employees are less skint. <laughs> your money, better welfare, better product, better productivity, better retention. Yeah, Fixed it, mate. Absolutely, Fixed it. Yeah. With finance lessons. Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, we, we've put. <laughs> Listen in. <laughs> but it makes me laugh. Like you speak to the blokes that are in now, and they get to halfway through the month, and they're absolutely on their ass. 
And they, they turn around saying, blokes are like starving on camp because they're on, is it pays your dine or oh, something? you've got to pay now, haven't you? You've got to pay for Yeah, she's so just thinking, yeah. what the fuck? So it's sort of like going around, um, what's it called around the corner, uh, co-op, going around co-op getting you 8p noodles, noodles like you used yeah. to get before you go on exercise. Yeah. Well, now blokes are living off them in the block, <laughs> like Stocky used to do. Yeah, <laughs> Stocky. Man, did I see Stocky recently? Did I see I don't Ah, no, I think you got, you got in touch with me on Facebook or something. I can't remember. No, I haven't seen him though. You, no. No, I ain't Stocky. There was, some, there was some flipping mentalists around that time. Not, I'm saying Stocky was a mentalist. <laughs> Stocky was mental. Yeah. Yeah. Funny. So, I mean, um, so, you, yeah, you, you got out then and hit the same issues, really. How did you, how did you manage to, how did you get control of it? Um, because it's not like you're sitting here like a failure. No, it's, uh, <laughs> I, I think when I, I, re- I really sat down there, um, like, if you do resettlement, um, did a CP course, and I did a plastering course, didn't use fucking any of it, really. And it was just because I, I kind of thought to myself, if I, if I need to make a, a break clean from the military, I've left because I liked home life again, even though I've never experienced it because I was so young, but you, you like what you see at home. I ain't going to go working abroad all the time. I ain't going to go, you know, working days at a time, weeks at a time, a- anywhere, really. Um but I didn't want to do anything military orientated. I sort of, I looked at the place and thinking, hmm, no, it's, it's still regimented to a certain degree. Yeah. Because I thought if you if I'm going to do it, I need to break clean because it'll just be sort of two three months and I'll be back in. Um, you mean go something completely almost opposite to uh, that 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 yeah military pr- yeah style. pretty much yeah. Um, I mean, don't know, it took me a few years to find my feet. Sort of bouncing job to job. Uh, did HGV driving. Uh, just anything that you know would pay the bills, I suppose. I got into that routine of moved in with my, with my then then partner, um, and it, if I'm being honest, you can just look at what everyone else is doing around you. I live in Oldham; it's quite a a poor town, so people just have your, your normal jobs, which is fine. So I kind of got into that routine of just doing what everyone else were doing, I suppose, but missing the reg every day, sat in the truck, going, "Fucking, I'm signing back on. I'm signing back on it." When I'm I suppose it opens about five years ago, maybe even less. I still thought, should I join back in? You know, you know, when you get, especially when you got to like early 30s, I'm like, time's running out if you're going to get back in. Because <laughs> um, you miss it, you miss the blokes. Um, and then just a chance came up to start learning about property investing. I seen it on a um, on a Facebook ad, funny enough. So I went on this free course. They just tried selling you a load of other courses. Um, and then just me being me, just started asking different people that I knew was doing it just different questions and how do you get into it? Not got a lot of money. I, I had some money, you know, probably about 20 grand saved up. Um, and it went from there, really. So we, we, we got into the, um, or I got into the property investment, <coughs> excuse me, it's gassy, that booze, into the uh, into the property um, world. Because um, back then it was 2008, I got my first property. Oh, my first bike to land. Cracking uh, timing. Yeah. <laughs> but they had, a, they, had a, they had a mortgage company and they'd, you could buy, say a house was worth 100 grand and you got a deal on it for, say, 80 because nothing was selling really. And it, 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 people said this is what led to the, the, the property know. crash. Your voice has gone lower because you feel so, a bit guilty about this. No, I don't know actually, no, because the house was an absolute <laughs> shithole. I've not even seen it. It's, it was actually my me, uh, me best mate's now wife that sort of phoned me, basically getting a house in St. Helens and it doesn't cost you nothing. You stick the deposit in, and the day after you refinance to pull your deposit out. How does that work then? So she went for it again. I went, I ain't got a fucking clue, but if it's going to work and get me house, I'll, I'll do it. So, you know, you make a couple hundred quid a month on it. Um, and then when I sort of speaking to other investors, they're all saying, that's my phone and thing. They're all saying, oh, we've, we've been doing it years. I've bought 100 properties. Like, I've bought 200 properties. I'm going, I'm in here. So buy and sell straight away. No, you, so you, you you buy on the Monday. Yeah. Because bear in mind you're buying it cheap. So if it's worth a hundred grand, you're paying eighty for it. I'm, I'm just talking numbers now. Yeah, yeah. So you put your deposit in at the eighty thousand, but because it's worth a hundred, the bank will refinance it the day after. So essentially, you pull your deposit back out. And some people were pulling extra. You know, they were buying a house for nothing essentially, and then because the difference of the discount they was getting, they were sort of putting ten, twenty, thirty grand in the back pocket, but rinsing it week in, week out. Um, and luckily for me, it 
the bank pulled the product a couple of weeks after, so I couldn't find anything else. And I say lucky because so many people got stung by doing the, the rinse and repeat, as they and were calling it. That was what was the product called? What do they call that? It was the. Uh... It was a company called uh, MX Mortgages. It was no, I mean what, that. What they attribute that that crash to um, uh, subprime mortgage. Subprime mortgage. Yeah, yeah pretty it, much. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So what, the knock-on effect of that was that. People are owed so much money on the mortgages, but they call it high gearing. So if you was at an 80% loan to value across your whole portfolio and you was only making, say, £100 per month per property, well, if 20 of your tenants have just lost their jobs and they don't pay you your your mortgage, you've still got to pay it. or pay you your rent, sorry. You've still got to pay your mortgage. And then it's a slippery slope, yes, <laughs> slippery slope down. So, you know. so, yeah. yeah um, and we just found other ways around it, really. We use investors' money now. I've got a business partner within the within the main property business that I own. How did you get? Hang on. How did you get through that financial crisis? Was- I only had one property to worry about. Right. And then um, I met my my business partner now, Pete. Um, we had a, I'll backtrack a bit. We'd already bought a few other houses, but what we're doing is going to landlords who we knew, <clears throat> um, basically saying, "Your house is worth five hundred quid a month. I'll give you five fifty. I'm going to do some work on it. And then what we'd do is we'd split that house into rooms, a bit like being in the block, a whole little bunk with a, with a big communal kitchen, um, which are called HMOs. It works really well in Oldham because there's people do work in the area but live live elsewhere. We've got the the, uh, the um, hospital there. We've got quite a few big employers, so it just suits suits a lot of Eastern European tenants as well because they're not committed to, to sort of long-term contracts. Um so essentially, we weren't having to fund doing what we was doing. It might have been costing five or six grand to do the refurb because you know we, we bought how well, we were we were renting houses that were fairly cheap um, and and in good condition. So sort of fast forward two years, we had a lump of money where we could then start buying. Mm. Um, I then met my business partner at that point, and he sort of said, "Fucking, are you making how much on them?" Right. Well, I've got some money. Let's put our money together, and then that's where we we literally just started buying houses and converting them. Mm. So yeah, how do you, do you do you do the work the conversions or? or do you, uh, what you used in? to do, used to do. I don't anymore. Just get the uh, pay, pay them in. Yeah, we we used to have a bill team, um, but it's like anything when you're currents doing the same thing day in day out because they were working on the same building site for six months. It's it really difficult to keep them interested and to keep that sort of level of work at where you want it yeah. to be. So now we basically just tender each job out. Um, Costs us more, but in theory, it should be finished quicker and to the right standard. Because obviously, if it's not the right standard, they're not getting paid. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's um, don't get me wrong; it's been by by no means easy. And there's been a few times where you're just literally on the on the skids of your ass, thinking, "What the fuck am I doing this for?" You know, it's kind of like a, a thankless task. But it's different when you're steering your own ship, though. It's almost like you can take. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong. You can you can take more crap. Because the the responsibility for difficulty of the task is on you, and the rewards that you'll reap if you keep going through the shit times come to you. Yeah, of course you know, I do. Yeah, I yeah. It's that you were saying it's interesting what you were saying earlier. <clears throat> you talk about Oldham and same across the country where people are in that people have this opinion, and and I had it, and I probably I probably had it until well yeah until within the last six months i'm lucky enough to be working somewhere i really enjoy now um so it wasn't through me going right i'm gonna ch- i'm gonna change my attitude in terms of how i look at being employed and earning money mm. um but it's it's that being that trap of nine to five so they, oh, i have to get nine to five because that's what the norm is i'm going yeah everyone will go and work, goes and work in the factory down the road I and mean, it's like from back home it's yeah classified you go work in the factory down the road and you know and then earn some money and then i can buy a place and or, or rent or whatever yeah so maybe save some money and i can exist fucking existing is not just enough you know it's, it's more to it there's other options it's yeah look look further than the flipping village door the town door and 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 and, and realize the entrepreneurial opportunity entrepreneur opportunities that there are um for everyone i think everyone has mega ideas all the time everyone yeah. does you know it's yeah. just it's just people aren't aware of how easy it is to seize on them and and to enact on something you think oh my god i need loads of money and i need six seven eight months no something can take a few weeks 
you fucking down tools, you put all your effort into it. If it's a if it's something you believe will work, people will buy into it and help you along the way. Yeah, of course. Will. Councils will give grants out. Charities will give grants out. There are um, uh, not for profit organisations will give grants out. You don't have to see sitting on twenty, thirty, forty, fifty k's worth of of money to make something work. You can get help along the way. It's just having the balls to step outside the outside of the outside of that. Um, I'll go back on that. It's not having the balls. It's being aware. There's other stuff. Yeah, I think people get people afraid of themselves. It's um, I've I've spent an awful lot of my own money on business development or as an, on self development, and you know you spend money to go on these courses, and you can tell like the idiots just read a book. And it, we had one business. Well, we, we didn't sign up, so it didn't cost us anything. But he was sort of telling us what he did as a business mentor and what he could do to you and bring sort of you into the businessman that needs to be. But his only fucking business was teaching people how to run a business. You get me? And I was just, but I said, you've, you've never run a business. So it's, there's loads and loads of advice out there. And, I, I, and the reason why I touched on that is because one of the blokes spoke to me the other week and mentioned this guy's name. And I said, just don't fucking bother me. I said, if you want any, there's loads of advice out there. There's loads of support out there. Vote for whatever you want to do. But the biggest thing, in my opinion, that the blokes, women, whoever, whoever need to get over is almost like get over yourself. Because they'll have an idea and they say, well, how do I put it out there? Well, you've got all the social media platforms, they're free. You know, you can build a website pretty much for free. Just build a, build a presence and, and be persistent and consistent. Just literally throw it down people's necks. Not in a, in a sales uh, point of view, but just sort of get the word out there. Because I see people um, set businesses up now, including some of the blokes, like family, friends. And it's kind of um, not half assed but because they don't believe in themselves and they're always worried about what other people think. And and for me, that, that's, that is a big thing. They're always worried about what other people think. And for me, it's fuck what other people think. Granted, if you're, you know, if you're doing something dodgy, then yeah, you're gonna have to worry about what people think. But if you genuinely believe in what you're doing and there's a, there's a target audience and there's a buyer, because at the end of the day, you're either selling a service or selling a product. It's one or the two and you believe in it, then then it'll work. You just need to make it work and show the value in what you're offering to the, you know, to your sort of, um, to your target audience. Yeah, I, I agree. It took me a long time. That's something that took me a long time to realise. I it, I mean, it's how the podcast came about mm. in terms of, and obviously it's not, you know, it's not a fucking business like you got, but, but I would care. I, I've had, oh man, the inverted commas, awesome ideas for different things over over the years I've had and I thought and I'm, I'm totally believing it and get that across the line I never I've ne- I'd never committed to it I thought, and it's just gone by the wayside not between you miss and I think fucking hell I could have that could have that could have been if I'd picked that up that idea up when I said it and pushed it forward that could have been it now as opposed to some other thing coming out similar to it a year later when I was a yeah. year ahead and think fuck me and I kicked the podcast and, and, and I thought there's two things what I'm saying is one uh, one is that that I thought, right, I've had this idea. How about let's not just fucking sit on it. Let's mm. just, if I'm saying I'm doing it, it's happening. Done. Yeah. It's done. Happening. And, and, and I have to make it, I have to put the first steps in place today because if I wait until tomorrow, I won't be doing it. Um, that was the first thing. And the second thing was the gulp moment when I realised, okay, if I'm going to do this properly, then I have to, I need to fire out, like you're saying, everyone needs to know about it. That, so, yep. like from a social media perspective, that means when I set up the H, the HR podcast page, when I, you know, that means I send an invite because this is the way you should. And you know, I'd read about it, and this is the way you should do it when you you're setting something up. You got to fucking tell everyone because your biggest supporters when you start out, your biggest supporters, whether they believe that your product or service will work or not, are your friends and family. Yeah, of course. So, so it's that guilt moment, for example, on Facebook. So, so basically, I need to invite everyone to come and like HR podcast, and it'll be in the back of your heads going. Fucking Hugh Key is doing a fucking podcast. <laughs> Dale Wilde set up a fucking business. But you know, b- 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 that's what it was. And fuck it, do it. Done. Yeah, of because it. fuck them. Because <coughs> stuff what they think, I believe in it. It's happening. You know, I totally agree with this. The biggest one. And, and I sort of reiterate it. Your biggest supporters, if you're going to set up a business or whatever it's going to be, your biggest supporters and get you off the ground are all your friends and family. You've got yeah. to get them involved. Tell everyone. Yeah. The, the only thing I, I, I would say about that from, from personal experience as well is that your family can sometimes become your biggest critic. So especially if you're doing something that's not normal. Not so much not normal. 
if you know if you're a reg bloke like like for me for instance for talk about it in a minute uh, I set up a sofa manufacturing business with a with me then business partner with, with a mate, um, and all the blokes are just going, you spin the reg, you can't make sofas. I, went, I know I can't fucking make sofas, but I can sell them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it was, and it was just loads of people just going, what you know, and it. Again, you just see the opportunity. You go through the figures, sort of based on on the knowledge you've got, and, and it's either yes or no. And for me, I hate the phrase "sort of dip your toe in the water." Bollocks, you're going, and it's you, you know it's just like jumping out of a plane. You, you you're not in or out. You're in or you're out. You know <laughs> you can't be both. Yeah. And it's fucking out. Just go for it. Um, and I think if you get that attitude and you get that focus behind you, you kind of. Forget about the the noise, what I call the noise around you, where it is just family, <laughs> friends, naysayers, fucking dickhead down the pub who just drinks booze every night and thinks he knows everything, because it, it's your future you're you're securing. So if you think about it in in that context, don't get me wrong, if you're trying to sell sand to an Arab, it, it's probably not want to go buy it. So mm. if but you've got to know your products right, and every product are, has a particular audience, regardless of what it is, someone will want to buy it. And as long as you can get in that and you're focused and, and give it 100%, I do genuinely believe that 99% of businesses can succeed. I, I genuinely mm. believe that. That's another important element they actually mention is that you, no, doing your doing your assessment correctly. I mean, yeah. I'm I'm not business trained, you know. I know profit and loss and, and that's about it. You know, I'm a great analyzer. How, how, how did you, you know, because you, you said there about, you know, go through the figures and, and make sure it's going to work. How what tools or what did you give us any training or did you get anyone involved before you sort of lit the blue touch paper to, um, to confirm in your head it was the right thing to do it at that time? I, d- I didn't get anyone else involved. Um, I, I suppose it, it is basically a game of profit and loss to simplify it. It is how much of my materials going to cost me? What's my wage bill going to be if there is one? What are my overheads? And what 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 do I sell it at the end for? So basically, you get the sale price, take everything else off, and, and look at it's the bottom line at the end of the day. Um, what was the first business? The f- my foot because the I've business got, you got now is not the first business you set up, is it? No, so I've got the property business as, as that's my 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 main sort of uh, focus. Um, I then set up a, a sofa manufacturing business. Uh, he was a neighbour actually. I helped him set up, and he just kept coming back saying, "You know, are we going to?" He he wasn't very good on the business side, and he was getting busier. I kept sending people to him to go and use him for sofas, landlords, or just anyone that I knew, basically. <clears throat> so I went through the figures, uh, all the figures he gave me. Uh, like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just thought, yeah, and if I can, if I can push this, we can, we can make decent money. Um, you know, he, he had the skill set, and I had the drive to sort of um, bring the business in. <clears throat> And I, I would say that if anyone's setting up a business with somebody else, if you've both got the same ap- attributes, don't fucking bother. You need to basically complement each other. So you need to be strong in one point and, you know, weak in another, if you like, so it can really work. Does that count for personalities as well? I suppose it could do, yeah, because personalities can clash. But I, I, I think if you get sort of, let's say, well, both reg blokes, because we've both got the banter, and for us, even though we haven't seen each other for, what, 10 years, there's no... Um, no barrier between as you know you could say whatever you want to me I could say whatever you want to you and, and that opinion's respected I know that you've had prick so, yeah, go. <laughs> go fuck yourself <laughs> it's not fucking ginger you are <laughs> dirty well. fox um, <laughs> so it's yeah oh, oh no so if you no, going back if you've got a business partner just make sure you sort of align and when I went to set the self company you know I, I did genuinely think it did align I could have brought the business in and he come on the shop floor. Um, overnight, brought a shitload of business in and it it just literally went through the roof. The vans were on the day 24-7. Sofa's flying out the fucking door. Um, and it, you could see it, you know, you see the profits going up. It was great. Um, and then there was there was a catalyst of, of errors, if you like, which I just hadn't seen and not been, and not, not sort of, took into consideration like Arthur Ladsey were paying him cash and, and like next to nothing and I'm like what? How, yeah. you can't fucking give a kid 40 quid a day <laughs> I mean he's on a saw to, he's on a saw for 10 hours I'll be ready fuck him well no not fucking because my name's above the door as well now yeah. so when you take that into consideration obviously <clears> the, <throat> the bottom line's disappearing and then 
obviously you need to put more vans on the road and it, don't get me wrong it was all relative but then i'm looking at the amount of work i'm doing thinking this is this ain't gonna be great mm. um and, and if i'm being honest i got i'll, I'll kind of prove wrong because we, we changed the way we did things we stopped selling sofas to trade we started selling to draw public and we're still doing the same amount of units still doing 30 40 units a week no <clears throat> no this was back then oh yeah, yeah um so you know it started to look good um and then Ian's brother decided that he'd had a big art. Well, they both had an argument over whatever. What was the brother's involvement in the business? Um, he just worked for us. He just worked w- uh, as a driver. Um, they had a big disgruntlement. And I'll be, I've never got really to the bottom of it. And there's all sorts of stories flying about. And uh, he broke in and burnt us down. And the, we weren't insured. So uh, okay. as much yeah. as I make a joke about about to the bloke, because... Uh, you know, you're probably seeing on social media every now and then there's a fire somewhere, they'll tag me in it and say, is, is, this, an, <laughs> is this another insurance job? Oh, I remember. <laughs> Wildy, Wildy wants a fucking Bentley. <laughs> the dicks. Uh, but, oh, yeah, but he burnt it down twice, didn't he? He did, mate. He, he, he went, he, he, the first one was a bin fire. I remember the newspaper articles. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'm famous, aren't I, obviously. Um, <laughs> a bit like fucking Brad Pitt, just got better looking. <laughs> I had Lev Wood on the other day, you've upstaged him. Uh, well, good. Yeah, he's he's gutted, mate. That line light's gone off him now. <laughs> yeah, never mind about him. It's all right. <laughs> Sorry, lads. Um, so, yeah, he, he basically broke in, tried setting a fire. He wasn't the brightest of people. So he sets it off in a bin and it basically set the fire alarm. So fire brigade turned up, put it out. Within a day, we're back up and running, um, which caused us no end of fucking problems with the fire brigade because they were coming in. Bear in mind, I'd never owned a business like this before. And because we hit the ground running, like literally day one, it was just boom through the door. Elf, elf and what? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they come in at five, five officers is going, mate, you fucking need to sort your head out. And luckily he was ex-military. Right. And he, he said, because of there's breaches everywhere in this thing, we, we need to get sort of like my gaffer involved. And I just turned around and said, mate, whatever we need to do, just tell me. All my staff are sat outside getting fucking paid to sit there, look at, looking here at you. Tell me he's doing, we'll do it. Right, okay, so anyway, late this afternoon, Gaffer came with his fucking hat on and that. And he's just turned around and says, mate, the place is a mess. He goes, but I do genuinely believe, out of all the years I've done this job, that you are going to put it right. I goes, 100% I'll put it right. And it happens that the landlord had to put a lot of it right because he'd split the units wrong. And <clears throat> uh, But what had happened is that the frame truck used to make our own uh, wooden frames. The wood skip got filled sort of two weeks before. And then when the guy came back to drop the empty one back off, he knocked a wall down so he couldn't get in. Um, so he was waiting. So we had like a, and I'm talking like a room twice size of this and it was full of Timber. wood. Yeah. Oh cut Wood cut offs. Obviously we knew it was a fire risk, but no one could get a wagon to give us a thick. So I explained that. And I guess obviously we're onto it. And the, the, I even showed him the emails from the skip company. So he's happy with it. So then we start to move <clears throat> All the wood. I was there with my Lamb Rover and trailer filling it up. My uncle coming home with a tractor filling it up just to take it to the tip, to the farm to burn it. Because um, <laughs> <laughs> it costs a fortune. And we literally got the place spick and spam, spent two and a half grand on a fire alarm. Uh, what else did we do? We did all sorts. And two days after, the little bastard broke back in, in the same place that we'd re secured, or the police had re secured, and uh, burnt the place to the ground. Fuck it. So the moral of that story is just wait a few weeks because in case they come back because I could have left all the wood there. Um, but yeah, that completely de- the built. There's nothing left of the building then. Um, so we, we set back up. Uh, I just because we had a bit of money in the bank, um, I had money which I could chuck in. So I said, let's just set set back up. Business partner have a pot to piss in, sort of hands and mouth kind of uh, of lifestyle if you like, or uh, the, uh, earn it, spend it kind of. And that was the guy whose brother it was. Yeah. So we set up sort of down the road and we went on for about another eight nine months and it was just hemorrhaging money but it was just me and you had that guilt element because you've got staff they've got families and uh i spoke to a mate who's got a really big business and he just went mate business isn't like that he said it's they aren't your problem you're your problem because it, it, literally all my savings were going That's, it's hard to have that mentality though that when you come back from, when you come from the military though and you're commander as you were you know it's yeah. like you got blokes and you you, you look, look after, after blokes yeah. or whatever fuck whatever. it 100% mate and that's where the mentality and I still yeah. I still can't get out of that mindset even now you know if if when you because again when you have these business guys come in they, they look at your your profit and loss sheet they, uh, and they go onto your account software and they're going fucking paying him out what's paying him doing that why is that happening and you're just going 
fucking hell, they're good lads, you know what I mean? They're here every day and they, they don't have a day off sick. So yeah. they've got loyalty to me, so I need to have loyalty back. And uh, from their argument, it is, well, you're in a business, mate, you're in it to make money. Uh, so perhaps I'll never be loaded. <laughs> it's just kind of, I'd rather <laughs> just sort of say, not the, the blokes to like, I don't really care if anyone likes me or not, but uh, as long as I, I know I've done the right thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, we shut, well, I shut that business down. I've had enough of it. Um, paid everyone off that we sort of owe money to, just suppliers and things like that. Just so, again, so I could look them in the face. Yeah. Most people would have just said, oh, fucking go bankrupt. It doesn't bollocks to them. Fucking even pay the tax, man. Um, and it's, so, but you can hold your head high. Um, and in between that transition, I set up a landlord furniture company. So we, so the houses that we convert into uh, the HMLs, I said before, yeah. we now supply furniture nationwide. So the guys turn up in a van in the morning and if it's a six bedroom house, we'll in, uh, install all six bedroom kits, sofas, dining tables, put it all up, take away the rubbish kind of. So, so if, so, um, a, so someone buys a house, going to give it into it. What's HMO stand for, by the way? House in multiple occupation. Okay, HMO. So if someone bought a house, mm-hmm. they want to convert it to a HMO. Yep. You basically got like ready to go kits. So because obviously the house has got a dining room, living room, and then it's like I don't know, let's say it's two bedrooms. Well, it's HMO is going to probably probably turn into like one living room. And the dining room is going to be a bedroom, and then so you got exactly, the kit ready yeah. to go for that. Then, exactly yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, because I was already in the industry and quite well known, um, for HMOs locally and, you know, you go on these sort of, um, <clears throat> HMO related forums, sort of shoot the shit on there, give people advice, newbies advice, because it's not overly hard and I think people do complicate it. There are obviously rules and regulations you've got to follow and the council are involved, which is fine for us at the end of the day. If, you, if you're above board, you've got nothing to worry about. For converting, yeah. For converting and for the management of them. Because okay. you've got, if they're over five five bedrooms now, they've got to be licensed. Lic- HMO license? Yeah, right, exactly, okay. yeah, through, okay. through the council yeah. um, or through your local council. So, um, yeah, we're kind of, we're kind of fairly well known. And because I was already in the furniture industry, got to know, just through the sofas, got to know all the people that supplied either wardrobes, beds or whatever. So we kind of put it all together, tested it, got the best products, got m- most of them we now manufacture or, or we're direct to the manufacturer. So they come in, so the product that we offer is pretty exclusive. How, how does it work, mate? If, if from, I don't know, from, I'm just trying to understand the logistics of it, like from a, a council tax perspective, uh, if you got, let's say, ignore the five when you need a license, if you got, you got, if you're going to have four tenants in HMO, mm-hmm. Do you have to notify the... How does that work with owning a, a property that you converted to a HMO? Don't make no difference. It's still a single dwelling, so you say... So we convert... Well, we've, we've just done... We're converting a pub at the minute, but... So if we go back to the back one... We've a done whole a, pub to HMO? Yeah. yeah. Flipping heck. Um, so go back to the last one we did. It's uh, It was a three-bedroom and terrace house. It's now a five-bedroom, five-ensuite HMO, uh, right near the hospital, because we've gone into, up into the loft and a loft conversion... And we pay the same council tax on that house than anyone else on the street, 110 quid a month, whatever it is. Jesus Christ. Um, but we pay all the bills because it is still a residential dwelling house. Um, but what some councils have introduced is, what well, boy, too much with it, but they've started introducing a council tax per room. Right. Um, so the way around that is basically not to have a cooking facility in the room. They've got to share a kitchen, which is how we do it. You have a big shared kitchen. So they can't really call it a flat, because of, but to pay council tax, it obviously needs to be um, a self-contained unit. Oh, I did not know this. So that's the way around it. Right. So for those tenants, they mm. they pay you their rent. Yep, and we pay all the bills. So essentially, it's like um, it is like being in the block. You know, you, you pay your 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 accommodation gets took out your wages, and you can do this in any house. Pretty much, yeah. That's mega. Some ha- some houses are, or some areas, have really strict planning laws around it, like uh, Salford near Manchester and Manchester City Centre, I think. Um, they have things, it's called Article 4, where you've got to have planning permission. And even when you apply for planning permission, that'll go... But planning permission for what, though? To convert into a HMO, because there's too many of them in the area. That's why they do that. What qualifies a HMO as a HMO? Uh, any any property with three or more people, three or more individuals from different families sharing. Right. There we go. Okay, I see. I got sharing. You. So, um, 
But if you only have three bedrooms, it doesn't really make financial sense. The re- the reason why it is it is a money thing, and there is a, from, a, from a business perspective. But there's also that there is a, a big need for, um, like I said to you before, that type of accommodation for local workers, people just coming into the area to work. Nurses, we have lots of nurses in our houses because we're just doing nice. We're doing like a. I suppose like a boutique hotel, you know, get the missus in there. She puts fancy wallpaper, put flowers in the corner, <laughs> nice beds, nice fancy furniture, en suite. And it's, you'd live there yourself. You know, it's, it, it's a far better standard what they used to be sort of five, 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, but like near the hospital, we can sort of get £120 a week per room. And, you know, in a five bed house, it's 30 grand a year. It's, you know, it's a lot of money. Obviously we pay the mortgage, we pay all the bills. But at the end of it, you're left with a, a, a decent amount of money. Must be hideous management, though, with like the cleanliness, the maintenance. Yeah. How, how do you? How do you? Because I'm, I'm assuming you don't put cleaners in there. Cleaners for the communal areas. Yeah. And then tenants clean their own rooms. What happens behind them closed doors? It's, it is what it is. You know, when when they move out, if if the rooms in shit state, then we'll we'll keep the deposit. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it's registered with a. Of the government scheme. Yeah, you've so. got to do that, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it is what it is, isn't it? It's, That's good. It's, uh, you yeah. got, because it means landlords can't s- stuff over flipping tenants. Like. Yeah, I think that landlords got a really bad name um, because of a few that got into the meat. It's like anything, isn't it? it all this bollocks now about Brexit. <clears throat> it's, everything's doom and gloom when you look at the media. When actually, you know, there's, there's different elements of it that could be quite positive. And the media just portray on a, anything on a negative light to get everyone out with the pitchforks. It, it, you know, it's, and like housing charities like uh, Shelter, whatever they're called, they, they call they call Shelter. They don't shelter anyone. They don't have anyone homes. They just cause a little shite for everybody, yeah. um, and bring in sort of well, help bring in legislation, which is fine. It needs doing. It needs to be a heavily regulated industry. I, I do genuinely think that, um, but I think everyone's tarnished with the same brush. You know, it's uh, I've got a mate who lives in the local village, and he always he always calls um, our houses bail. Are you still doing them bail hostels, them shit holes? <laughs> so and he just does it to wind me up. So just before Christmas, um, I just went, "Listen, Mark, come come with me. I need to show you around one of them just to shut you up. You do my head in." <laughs> and we just we just uh, put some furniture in the pub conversion we're doing into a couple of the rooms. And uh, so I took him down there because I remember drinking in here. And he walked around, and he just went, mate, put it there, he shut my hand. And he went, I never expected this. He goes, better than my own house. <laughs> I said, no, you're a fucking tramp. <laughs> but it, then they are re- no, they're really nice, really good places to live. And I think between me and my business partner, Pete, we'd also always have the ethos. If we won't live there, then we don't expect anyone else to. Um, so I think having that, it's, that sort of proved well for us. And we've always... We've had some dick tenants. We've had some complete uh, yeah. knobs. We've had to go full on reg on them, but um, <laughs> <laughs> get the fuck out. Um, well, yeah, it's works all right, mate. It's it is our work. Man, let's see and say it, it. You know, it's it's easy, um, but it goes back to what we were talking about before. That I didn't have any education in it. I just knocked on doors, asked questions, kept asking people to borrow money, and because uh, uh, we, we do we to do these developments, it's not you know not trying to make out we've got loads of money. We do borrow family and friends. Um, and they, but they get a really good interest rate, and then at the end we refinance. They get a mortgage on it, and they get all the money back. Um, and going down to asking them type of questions, you know, you got hundred grand you can borrow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what do you do? Do you, <clears throat> and when you speak to me, would you have a beer? Oh, you didn't hear yeah, right? Yeah, <laughs> you got hundred grand like, like on the mattress. <laughs> so it seemed quite thick. <laughs> it's a really awkward conversation. Um, but going back to what I said before, it is just you've got to ask them awkward questions, put yourself in. If you feel comfortable, then you're not, go, you, you're not at your full potential. I've, I've always, you know, if you feel comfortable in what you're doing, if you sort of get up in the morning, ah, okay, everything's fine, everything's fine and dandy. You sort of, you get to the day after and it's almost like you've not progressed because you're always operating in your comfort zone. Yeah, but that, I don't, mm, I, I I agree with you hundred percent, but that's not everyone, you know. Um, no, no, I suppose not. People like that. I mean, I, so this goes back to that nine to five thing. I mean, there are there are people that why that that, are sick, that could be listening to this now. Well, I suspect mm. the kind of people listening to this podcast aren't those kind of people. That's not. What I just doubt it, just because I have a circle of friends yeah. and because obviously I got all my Facebook friends and family on Facebook invited to the podcast. Yeah, <laughs> but um, 
you got friends <laughs> they, they'd be thinking oh hang on a minute why would you not want to feel comfortable why not just do what you need to do to get in watch coronation street get the get go down to the gym three times a week and you know just chill out and have your routine and like and absolutely see how that is awesome sometimes yeah. I wish I had a brain like that. I do wish, yeah. because imagine how less, less stress there would be. And you get to 65 or 60, I don't know when we get a pension, and you get your pension, and you're kind of doing the same thing, except you're just eating more pot, uh, super noodles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you go to the gym less. Yeah. But I can understand it. I can understand it. I, um, maybe that's the two sides, maybe that's like, the, that's the two sides of, of sort of, um, a, a professional adulthood attitude. You either, you you want you just want chill. I want to earn my money, do what I can do outside of it, and just relax and have no stress. And on the yeah. other side, you want to have smash it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. There's always yeah. something. Have idea. Yeah. Do this, do that, do this, do that. Yeah, you know? but, yeah. I, th- I think I suppose what we're relating to is that the guys that come out and want to set up on their own, as we run about, yeah. you've got these ideas and and put it into put it into action. If you've if you've got the, that kind of mentality, I do think that that that's what pushes you forward. And then, you, like I say, you have your other end. I, I've never been, and again, I, I would love to have the mentality where I earn X amount, I got to work Monday to Friday, and I'm happy as a pig and shit. Mm. I would love it, but I don't know. I've always won't been one to keep busy. Sometimes I do busy for I'm busy, and I, I get to the end of the week, and I've done it loads of times. I spoke to Lisa the other week. She went, fucking hell, I've had seen you this week. I went, I don't even know what I've done. I feel like I've just squandered the week, and then you look back, and so I start to keep a diary of um, just shit you're doing there today you know whether it be work meeting up with the blokes ringing customers you started doing that yeah i've started doing it yeah one to be more productive and just two to see what the fuck i do with my time literally i mean leading up to christmas and first few weeks to this month we've been really busy with the furniture business we've booted half the builders off this pub conversion because they're just knobs luckily i've got a, a a i've borrowed a builder off a friend I'm quite friendly with the builder anyway. Kevy's come on and sort of rescued the day. Um, and like people saying, fucking hell, mate, you look tired, you look ill, just sort your head out. And when I'm like tallying up the hours, I'm like doing 80, 90 hours a week. Just, and I'm, I'm in bed. Mrs. sort of wanting a weekly visit and you're just like, just fuck off. Visit. <laughs> I'm married now, so it might be a fortnight. <laughs> She'll fucking kill me for saying that. <laughs> My mum might listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> but it's... Um, yeah, so I've done, I started to do it just so I can look back at. Maybe I just keep busy. Just, it's a good thing to yeah. do. Uh, there's, a, there's a few things I realised um, over the last. Oh, you're in three years. I got divorced. I I, I separated from my ex-wife in 2015, end of 2015, and then um, I'll be, be with my. My part, I was going to say my current partner now. <laughs> my partner. I <laughs> know <laughs> I miss it. <laughs> this is the wrong place. My, my, my missus, Kate, for fucking hell, two, three, sixteen. We're into our third year now. Mm. You know, I won't, I won't, right, I won't be with anyone else. She's fucking amazing. You know, it's one of, the, it's one of the, in fact, that, I had the conversation, I said, I oh, wish I'd met you years ago. And it's one of those, well, one, would never happen. And, uh, just because of circumstances and two, we wouldn't be in, enjoying the, it, it the way we are now. It's just one of those. It's, it's life, yeah, of isn't it? it is, yeah. Um, but think, can I write the quest there? Uh, love you, Kate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he's talking my leg. Swear, swear, <laughs> once a day with her, mate. It's not once a week. <laughs> um, fucking hell, she didn't kill me. Where was I? Where was this? Oh, yeah, a few things I learned. So, o- over the time, uh, in fact, one of the things I, I one of the problems I had. I, and I think this is down to, um, leaving the military, um, and yeah, leaving the military, having a lack of sense of purpose. And, and then it was sort of, it, I only noticed it. I only started to notice the symptoms of, of it when sort of I was going through a divorce. And at the same time, a divorce, we were selling them out at home. You know, so divorce is like the most stressful thing in the world. And then selling the house at the same time. It's like, fuck it out. So things became magnified to me. And, mate, I was just jack. I was just, uh, like, I couldn't, uh, there was things I couldn't do. I wasn't looking after myself, you know. Like, yeah. Little things like fucking brushing my teeth, you know, brush teeth twice a day. It'd be, a, a, I'd just, uh, 
mental struggle to butt myself to go and brush my teeth if I fucking did it once a day. If that, yeah. right? Honest, on it, I'm, I'm speaking frankly, it's because this is the way it was. Um, to things like, uh, washing my fucking, bear in mind, straight after that, I was living on my own. You know, washing my dishes up after me. Um, reading a book. You know, sitting down and chilling in front of the TV for an hour and just chilling in front of the TV. And it took me, fucking hell, nearly two years to, to try and, why is that, you know, it was up and down, up and down, up and down, worse at sometimes, better at others. And it was, and what I put it down to was, I didn't see those things as productive. They were achieving nothing meaningful. Yeah. What am I achieving by brushing my teeth? It, you know, it, this is how, this is how basic it goes down to. Yeah. W- wash my dishes straight away. Well, you know, and, but I'm, I'm, it, I didn't think about it consciously like that, but at the time, it's, I'm not, I'm not doing that because it's not achieving anything. So what I'd do instead, I'd be, sit, you know, I couldn't sit and watch TV. If I put the TV on to put a film on, I'd be doing two or three other things at the same time. I'd have a laptop open blah, 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 and doing like work stuff. Not because of the job I was doing, but because the other stuff was just bullshit, not meaningful. It, 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 it was weird, really weird. Yeah. And what I've learned over time is, you, you are more, I'm more productive and people are more productive. And this is like a proven thing. You go on the health, safety and welfare side of things. I've got a background in health and safety and, I, and, and, um, I can see how it is beneficial for companies and individuals to, to in, put it in, put things in place and follow the rules. If it's done properly, if you've got the right person doing the health and safety managing and it's put across the right way, companies become more productive, more profitable because of it, you know? Um, and, and part of it is that, like you're saying there, you're writing a list of what you've done throughout the day. Uh, that's you chilling, mate, and reflecting on what you're doing. What are you mm. achieving by writing a list? Nothing for the business, no. but you're just taking your brain off from like work, work. You remember what you've done through the day, uh, you're writing it down, uh, and it, it's, a, it's a switch off. It's that disconnect. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, and it's vitally important. That's what I, I had to sort of remember to persuade myself. Um, is that you, you got to take a, a step back. You, to to be a productive individual, to maximise your potential, as you were saying, you have to be good at the whole package, making sure, yeah, you're doing what your job requires you to do, or doing, what, but you're also doing what you need to do to keep your optimal mental state. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah. Keep yeah. fit. See the blokes or the ladies. Yeah. See your mates. Take an hour. Take a fucking two hours to do something other than work or spend time with your partner. Watch a film, read a book. For me, it's podcasts. You know, listen to yeah. podcasts. Not wait. I not think wait. you need you need you time. I know it's like a it's underestimated. A, yeah, it's underestimated. yeah, it is. And people sort of make a joke about, oh, it's all about me. And it's even whether that's just getting up early in the morning before you go to work and just going beasting in the gym, <clears throat> headphones on, listening to your shit music, and you know, having that time away where your phone's not ringing, no one's pestering you, and I suppose trying to get into that zone where you just away from everything me and the missus mate um just before christmas yeah sort of i think it was october november or maybe december time and we sort of identified the same kind of thing like both really busy take the job stickers all over the place um so it's very hard to align time in to have time with each other we said well we're always together in the morning we're, you know we spend the night together we said well what about getting up at six Bear in mind, normally we wouldn't have to, to seven, for example. We get up at six, we go downstairs, sit on the couch, stick the TV on, fucking BBC morning show or whatever. Mm. No phones, but six till whatever time I leave, I normally leave earlier. That's me and you down there doing nothing. It's nothing. That's nothing time. It doesn't impact any other stuff we need to do because in the morning, nothing needs to be done at six or fucking 6.30. No. Um, and, and she's a lot like me when I think, and she said, yeah. I was surprised she said yes. He's like, yeah, let's yeah. fucking do it. Um, mate, we've gone, we've, it's fallen by the wayside recently, but we go down there, get up at six o'clock in the morning. You think, well, you'd be tired because you get up an hour earlier. No. Set you up for the day. Your mind is clear because you, yeah. when you wake up, you're not straight on to thinking about work or rushing to get out the door to the car. You're sitting there chilling. You're not rushed. You're relaxing. You're with the person you love. You're not fucking in Facebook. Fucking in Facebook, you know, fucking on, <laughs> on, on, on your phone, <laughs> <laughs> on Facebook. And yeah. it was, uh, it was, it was surprisingly positive. It was all, it was fucking all, in fact, yeah. I'm going to speak to her after, we're going to get back onto that. <laughs> <laughs> and you probably enjoyed it because you both wanted to do it. Yeah. It's, it's probably less enjoyable if Mrs. Laugh. Fuck's sake, really? 
<laughs> coming downstairs like dressing gown over red oh. well she does yeah. have the, she did there was a caveat with it I had to get up first put the kettle on and yeah. she would come down about 6.15 so she wasn't first out of bed yeah <laughs> <laughs> you sat there with a the coffee yeah bless yeah. you yeah but no, it's, far it's, too nice to the girl yeah. <laughs> sat, sat, I sat you time like you're saying you fucking gotta do it mate could bring on to that Project RV mega Come on, give us some airtime you went down this weekend mega yeah it's uh cine- oh, you know what he's like it's John he's seen him advertise it on, on Facebook and social media and that, that up, I'm in the uh, in the old WhatsApp group and I've just never had time to go down I've always found it. I love being with the blokes mate it's for me that that's my real me time uh, you know you're, you're about or I'll go wild camping just with my best mate with the fuck off up in the hill brought back mountain shit um, listen to classic FM on his phone <laughs> Um, so yeah, I went down there, managed to rally a few of the blokes together. So, uh, Pete Ace, Dave Ellis, um, the Colonel. Dave Ellis, blonde hair, Dave Yeah. Ellis. Ah, he's a good lad. Right, good looking bastard he is. Yeah, yeah. Fucking hate him. But if you put black hair on him, he'd be like that, um, the tall guy off of, um, The Inbetweeners. <laughs> <laughs> would he not? He would, wouldn't he? <laughs> he would be, yeah. Oh, what a monk. <laughs> Mega, I'm going to beast him for that after. <laughs> <laughs> Just been speaking to you. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to it. Yeah, go on. Yeah. So we went down there. It's um, obviously down in Brecon. Um, it squared away to do some quad biking. Uh, just around a farm. John, right. Explain Project Ave for people in. So, go on. So Just basically, he, he set it up. It's a it's a bit like a non-profit. He doesn't like the word charity because it's not charity. So basically, it gets donations in. Him and his uh, motley crew, uh, Nadine and Jeff. Uh, you know, they do a styling job, get a few quid in, and then when it, they organise a, a trip or an event, events weekend, and it's just open out to the blokes. There's reg blokes, marines. At the minute, I think they're opening up to sort of everybody. Uh, from what I've, what, 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 I think so. Yeah, that's what they're on about doing. Um, I mean, yeah. it, might, it might have been Peter talking Changed shit. Changed his bloody me. mind. Then I said that he said fuck me clean off. Did he? Right. Okay, yeah. I might be on then. Pete Ayres, he's got an alien head on him. He went back at car, chewed my fucking ear off for four hours. I don't think he's, he's, he's inviting anyone who want to come. <laughs> so anyway, well, well, we'll go back on that. It's just fucking bootnecks and, and power edge. Um, so he don't fill me in. Uh, but it's just great to see the blokes. He organised uh, this... We say he, you're on about John Bream. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, squared away. So I'm, like I'm assuming every, everyone knows him. They should know him. Uh, you can't fucking not hear him. Um <laughs> And he, you know, went quad biking. Just, just it, it, if you don't, if people listen to don't know John Bream is off his fucking head. He's done, in fact, he's done a podcast. He's done a he's podcast. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. People, yeah. But people say to me, "Oh, yeah, listen to all your podcasts." They don't, mate. Listen yeah, to, listen to their mate, and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Ten minutes of it. I'll just say your Welsh voice and turn off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it was it was just great to go down and see the blokes, um, and he really wants to make it. Someone, I, I do genuinely think with his enthusiasm, all, all joking aside. I, I think he'll do it because he's he's got some good people around him. He'll do what? As in expand the the project's RVs, get more blokes coming, get some more money in. He um he just wants to sort of make it a regular thing where as many blokes as possible can get together. And he will. Uh, he, he mate, it's one thing I've I didn't know John very well when he was in at all. And if you listen, you should listen to podcasts we did because he brings up this. I said he brings up the last time you remember seeing me and and I was being a complete prick. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell his story. <laughs> Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, so he told the story. Um, but I mean, oh man, he is, he is, he is mental, good mental. You know, his brain's all over the place. He's proper entrepreneur, um, entrepreneurial brain, you know, not entrepreneur, start up loads of business to make loads of money. No, he does things for real reasons. Um, and for Project, R- Project RV, what I've, Obviously, I come to know John Bell now. I met him in, in London the other week. What he doesn't do, and this is a true, a true ex- example of what you're saying. Where you reckon he's 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 generally motivated by it. When we sit down and chat, every time it comes about um, a conversation, somehow it comes up with him. Um, and it's not Project Harvey. He never mentions Project Harvey, right? Uh, not not um to like sell it to me because he doesn't he doesn't need to. But what is a recurring theme with him is the is that he feels there's too much of a disconnect with the, with, the, with the blokes. When I say blo- with the blokes, when I say blokes, let's just say let's say by blokes, I mean ex-military personnel mm-hmm. in, involved in fucking women. Right? Mm-hmm. So there's too much of a disconnect with the blokes. There's guys struggling we don't know about. 
he feels a sense of this is what I get from it. And he's man, you know the passion he's got. It's mm-hmm. unbelievable. He, he it destroys him that there are people out there that could be struggling with stuff and 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 then they've, they've got they can't see any help with it. Yeah, it destroys him that uh, you know, like Sean the way Sean is, but it, uh, as in Sean Bowers. But again, John fixes that by getting Sean Bowers involved with that event. Yeah. And you you are on about like people like Rob and other people like that. Mm-hmm. It he just. He's seen something that he thinks he can do to help people out. It doesn't matter how few people he helps out. He's still helping people out. Yeah, of course he's, yeah. And yeah. it's so honest what he does. He's so passionate with it, which partly because he's mental as well. It's, he's unbelievable. Yes, 100% honest with it. 100% honest. And I do hope he expands it. I do, I do hope that, um, he expands it to more cat badges. I generally think that. I think because yeah. he's so good at what he does, <clears throat> when you limit it to just Power Edge Marines, right? That's great. But then on the flip side, like I said, he's doing a good thing. Get more people in. Help more people. He can help more. Or they. Him yeah. and his team can yeah. help more people. They'll benefit yeah, everyone. They, they do. And, and I, I genuinely, genuinely think that they are genuinely passionate about what they're doing. All, all, all three of them. There might even be someone else involved, actually. But there, there is. You've got one leg Joe. Ah, right. Okay. So I never met Boot one leg like Joe. Yeah. I think I would have noticed him. Um, <laughs> what he says wrong with his eyes. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I do. I genuinely think they've they've all got hearts of gold. You know, it's, I said to you before. I don't normally warm to people first time meeting them, but obviously I knew John. Um, but uh, Jeff and Nadine, you just see like the, the, there's real passion there. They just want to just want to help the blokes out. And w- when I was speaking to John about about sort of you know what come across it. And he, he was writing what he's saying. He said, you know what, mate? He said, you've got all these charities there. Because I'm not taking anything away from them. He says, but all the charities that I know of help guys that got injured on ops. He said, which is fine. You know, they only... He said, but there's loads of them. He, and he, he was sort of saying, what about fucking me? I've been on loads of ops. He said, we've all... We've all he said, don't care who you are. You've all, you all think about what you did day and night. And I, you know, I've got to agree with that. You do think about it, right? Do you think about Vafkan? And he goes, but what, what's for us? He said, what's for us? We, we still went there, all right, yeah, we didn't get injured. He says, but, and we've still got, you could call it demons, you could call it whatever you want. He said, but what what is out there? He said, so I would just thought of saying, well, I'm opening up for everyone. I'm not bothered if, and uh, Sean was like, I'm not bothered if you're like, this fucking idiot in a wheelchair. <laughs> you've got one leg. You've you've turned yourself into a chick. Oh, I don't care, but I want the blokes to be the blokes, not for it to be structured, not to look at us thinking we're getting paid money because they don't, they, don't they don't get nothing out of it. He said, I just want it to be where they can come enjoy themselves. And when he gets his mad head on, he says, I just want to be fucking parachuting. He said, I want to chuck that prick out of a plane. And uh, obviously Sean sat there in his wheelchair going, you can fuck off. <laughs> and he's like, I am going to chuck him out of a fucking plane. <laughs> and you, you just have to, I mean, people listen to it going, that's tight as fuck. He, he, he's so, he, he's just so humorous with it. And But you can, like you said, you can tell his enthusiasm of where he wants to go. And he, he's got... He's got a reason and a genuine reason for doing it. <clears throat> and I think that's why I warm to it more. And like me and Pete saying, come, we'll, we'll chuck some money. And we both got, you know, I've got my own business. Pete's got a really good job. It's not about, and he goes, it's not about that. He says, I don't care if you come down here and you're a multimillionaire or you ain't got a pot to piss in. So I want you to be the blokes. And obviously we're all sat in this sort of, what, what you call it, basically a fucking greenhouse where we're sleeping at night. Um, and it just ban it. It was literally like being on exercise with the blokes. You know, when you used to play enemy every now and then, and you're just in like some shitty barn somewhere in the middle of Brecon Beacons, like we was. And it it was just it was just meant. And I think the more he gets the word out there, um, you know, the blokes will, will help him do that. Particular lads that have been going on it. Um, I think more and more people will go, mate, and we'll become more aware. Mm. And I think it'll become something pretty special, mate. I do. Yeah. I genuinely think that. He, he, I mean, he travels up from where Southampton, or Plymouth, to fucking Brecon. You know, yeah. it's his own time. But the the thing that, yeah, the thing is with it is, we're just thinking there is that you you get out, and this is where the uh, you or me, two arms, two legs, no visible injuries, you know, um, and. I don't mean that saying we got invisible injuries. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? No, no, no. Uh, and then you've got the other end of the spectrum where you've got amputees <clears throat> or whatever else. And you go into Civic Street and there's that. There's, there's awkwardness every day. Awkwardness every day. I, I, especially, no. There's awkwardness every, every day for people with visible injuries, right? And the visible injuries that, that scream war veteran, like yeah. an amputation. 
for example. Yeah. Um, or a fucking wheelchair, right? Uh, and the, 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 the awkwardness every day is that knowing that this, this, this people, you're meeting people. You'll meet people for the first time. Let's say, let's say, uh, Sean. Let's say Sean. Okay. Who, I mean, you don't have and probably the, to see him, you wouldn't immediately think veteran. But there's awkwardness every day he, he, when he meets people. He's probably got around it now where, where there's always that he, you're thinking, I'm imagining, you're thinking they are wondering how I'm like this. Mm. And for other people, they're wondering how I, how I lost my leg or my arm or why I'm fucking missing half my cheek or, you know, any of that. And there's awkwardness with it. And it's that, and when you go and meet up with the blokes, when you go down those project, I'm not being a project of me, but I, I, I get, when you're talking about it, I get the same feeling I get when I meet up with the blokes and shoot the shit. And, yeah. and the feeling is relief in that barriers and awkwardness are fucking gone. Yeah. Cause you're a, yeah. you're a target for ridicule. <laughs> yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> no one, sure. no one's safe. Yeah. And it's the best thing ever because you don't have to worry about then the elephant in the room. You don't have to worry about it, you know? Uh, uh, and, and it's, it is, it's a relief. It's, it's more enjoyable. It's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and chill out now with people who don't give, don't give it a damn how or, or what happened. And they, and if they ask me about it, they're gonna ask me straight up. How'd you lose a leg mate? How are you in a wheelchair, Sean? You know, this, that, and the other. Yeah, and it's that, yeah. and it's that blase. And that, and that's how it should, I mean, that's how people, I think, unless you're, you know, depending on your approach, it could, could, should or could ask. Like, Civ Pop shouldn't be afraid to all it in the right way, you know. Um, if he's blatant like you're a veteran, Dale, when you lost your leg, do you mind asking, uh, you know, I lost your fucking leg, as opposed to the awkwardness and, yeah, and, so and, and that knock. Yeah, 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 like, do you know like, what I mean? So, yeah, that, but, yeah. so going back, that's why it's also such an amazing experience to meet up with, whether it's me and you chatting now. And I mean, I'm enjoying this because, because of the way we're talking, because like you said, we can fucking slag each other for all, all, all day long. I haven't seen you in what? 10 years, maybe? Easily, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like yesterday, you know? And yeah, he is an amazing thing. I, I, yeah, yeah, I know, I'm waffling shit there. No, you, no you, shit. You, it, it's valid points. And, and I do, I always say it, like, um, you don't see the blokes for ages. And when you do meet, like I said, it's been 10 years. I don't feel any different than, than it is. Got in 2007, I think it's 12 years, mate. 12 yeah, years, 12, yeah. Never yeah. right, got it counting. No, actually, no, I'll tell you what, we'd, I'm, I'm, <laughs> you can fuck off. Because i tell you, i seen you the other My week. podcast, you can fuck off. <laughs> Out. <laughs> he, um, we, we actually seen each other at the Trafalgar Cup last year, the year before, in Collie, rugby. You turned up to that. You might have been pissed. Ah, no. Uh, yeah, I saw you yeah, there. Yeah. No, I, I wasn't pissed. I was driving. I didn't even know it was on. Yeah. Why were you dressed up. like a cunt? You had us like a shit suit. On. I've been, I've been. <laughs> it's called a suit, mate. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've been working, and I saw it on Facebook. Oh, fucking hell! So it went along here. Yeah. yeah. I mean, stay along. It was a weird. Uh, it was a weird experience for me that I rocked up in a suit, and I, I, it was a bit. Yeah, I don't like. Um, sometimes when I'm with the blokes, I bump into blokes are still in. I haven't seen mm. for a while. I don't know why. I feel, uh, I don't, I, I dread the question of what are you doing now? What are you up to? I don't know why that is. Uh, mm. Whether I dread it or whether it's, I, I don't know why. I don't know why that is. Other than that time it was anyway. No, really? I, yeah. That, in fact, I go back. Then it was, yeah. Then it was, that was the yeah. case then. No, yeah. not, but you had no. a lot going on then though, didn't you? Really? Fucking fuck loads yeah. going on, yeah, mate. Yeah, <laughs> but, so um, I can understand that. And then, I, and, the, and there was people there, I, 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 well, I knew all the guys in uniform were there. And I serve some of them, and some of them I didn't want to fucking associate with, so I, I bugged out earlier, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> but we we only went down because we uh, sponsored the the rugby team. Cheers, Dave Nunley, you cock. <laughs> Sponsor rugby team, mate. It's fucking <laughs> mint. We go to New Zealand. I'll get you on the trip. I was like, yeah, nice one. Got Collie and um, <laughs> is a fucking grand for your kit, you prick. <laughs> um, no, it, it's been all right to be fair. And to be fair, I. I did that because it was more. I wanted to see. It was just an excuse for me to see the blokes more. It was kind of. I, ne- I need to be around the blokes. I need them. You know, it's like it's like your mum in it. You just oh, slag them off all the time, but you still need them, kind yeah. of thing. And uh, but funny when, when we were driving down there, I had uh, Billy Owen in the back of the car. You had uh, Billy Owen in the back of the yeah, car. Yeah, no way. Imagine that. <laughs> like, two heads like that. 
<laughs> them two heads in a car. Hey, <laughs> look like that's another podcast. Nodding. You could do a podcast about Bill- Billy Jen. <laughs> <laughs> so we bear, bear in mind, like Bill spent years in patrols, and so we go. We're driving down. He's lived in Collie for years, and I, I actually never went on the new camp because uh, I left oh, when we were still at Hyderabad. Okay. I, I, yeah. As the lads were moving the kit over. Um, the boss said, oh, you may as well fucking stand on your kitten and stand down. So basically two months at home and obviously I was like, oh, see you later. Um, so we're driving down the rugby field, you know where it is. But Billy sat in the back and went, Bill, where is this rugby field? He said, I ain't got a fucking clue, mate. I says, right, so text Dave Nunn. Dave Nunn sent me the postcode, so stick in the sat nav. We've been to Leicester, pick Billy up, you know, like you do. So we're going down there. And I'm fucked me because we drove all the way from Manchester. Yeah, a bit of traffic. Uh, but we're staying down there. We're going on the piss. Dave Bradshaw, his missus, my missus. We're going to be a, a good, good old little shindig. So we uh, we pulls up at the, the rugby club. Billy Owens like, I never fucking knew this was here. He said, I've, I've, "No," he said, "I never knew how to get to it." And I don't know. I don't know his name. He was a proverb at the time. Tall guy. He was in when when I was in, right. but I never knew his name. And it, he was sort of stood from me to the sort of laptop away, and he went. Billy, do you remember that apartment me and you lived in together? He went, yeah. He went, fucking there. <laughs> <laughs> and well, there was loads of us stood around me going, you fucking idiot. And he's just going, Jen Up didn't even know this was here. He said, because he'd obviously just seen the back of the building. I went, you didn't know there was a fucking rugby field in It's other, massive. The There's kids, like 10 pitches. The other kid's going, well, if you went in my room, you had them Juliet balcony things. You opened the door and it overlooked the fucking rugby pitch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. What's Billy doing now? Uh, I believe he's still on the rigs. Um, he was a mate. You in touch with him or not? Yeah, yeah, still speaks to him quite a bit. Um, well, I, well, I'm trying to get him down to the RV, but it was because he's home at the minute. Um, but he, it's his, it was his daughter's birthday or something. Should we talk about Billy Jen? Yeah, it's Billy Jen, his stories. I can't, I'll tell you a Billy Jen story. Go on, tell me. So I, I'll just, I'm going to caveat this. I never heard any of these firsthand, I don't think. I don't think I did. However... So Billy Jen, so people listening or watching are familiar with the term Jen. Jen means it's true. <laughs> it generally means it's not. So Billy got his name Billy Jen because he, he, he was a master storyteller. Stories, but he telling like the fact. The one I heard, right, was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard is that uh, Billy once told a story that he had a, he, when he's on his motorbike, he used to, on the corners... <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember this going? thing? Yeah. In the corners of his motorbike, he used to get down that low on his motorbike in his corner. It's like, <laughs> you know when the, the, the motorbike, uh, the, the racers have the, the, the skid pad on their knee, they get their knee down. Billy get down that low, he had to put the skid pads on his helmet. <laughs> <laughs> I even knew the story. See, the, but the one, in, in all fairness of the one I heard, it was his mate that did it. Ah, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, that's mutated then. Yeah. He, I reckon Billy told one duff story and then every, and then he just got made up, invented. <laughs> I heard another one. That, the other Billy Gem was, was, um, he was in, uh, <laughs> sorry, Billy. Uh, he, he, he was in, in, he's in Afghan, in a Chinook, <clears throat> and the Chinook had an underslung load, and the, so he's inside, and, uh, they're flying along, and they've got a drama. The drama with the Chinook. I just don't know what the drama was because I wasn't there. If it even happened, right? <laughs> Neither was anyone else. Happened, right? And the release mechanism to release the underslung load. So underslung load, people, is where you see fucking helicopters and got a big line and they're, they're carrying like a, they're carrying like on the end of a, 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 a line underneath the Chinook, like, um, I don't know, a bundle of fucking ammunition or whatever, food or whatever. So the release mechanism doesn't work. And it's critical now. This, the Chinook's going to crash if they don't release it. The loadie refuses. Uh, the, the loadie turns around and said, and says, we need someone to climb down the line <laughs> and release it manually. Guess who put his hand up? Billy Jan. <laughs> 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 there was loads of them. There was fucking loads of them. <laughs> loads of them. The motorbike one's my favourite one, though. Do you know yeah. what, though? It's, <laughs> I know his nickname is Billy Jen, but it, you can't help but love the bloke. Yeah. Well, everyone twists the, the, odd, the odd story, don't Oh, they? I know, yeah. I know, but when you yeah, yeah. about that with the helmet, oh, I, don't, I think I, I actually, a little bit of me died because I cried that much laughing. It just fucking, <laughs> he's so funny. I remember, uh, you'll have to have cheese next time you see him. He's, um, it, no, it weren't cheese, it was uh, Pete Ace. So they'd just come to patrols 
Obviously, me and Billy had been in patrols for a couple of years at that point. And because uh, I just always Billy, 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 because we had Billy, Billy Bayliss. And uh, I was like, oh, Billy Jen. <laughs> so we was out on the piss. And uh, me and as in me and Billy Owen. And uh, Pete Hayes come over and goes, oh, I, I go took Billy Jen then. And Billy just turned around to me and said, call me that again, I'll smash your fucking face in. <laughs> I just went, all right. Because <laughs> so, he had like a really angry looking face, didn't he? He's yeah. got a, he's, his middle name's Glyndor. Yeah. He's Welsh, isn't he? He's part Welsh. Yeah, he is, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know. He, he's another Funny bloke guy. he's done really well since being out. He's done, Has he? What's he done? He, oh, on well, the rigs. He's, he's, uh, we're a medic on the rigs, I'm sure. He's like a health health and safety officer now. Oh, I vaguely um, remember when he got out and he, he was doing that stuff, yeah. Because he, he is a clever fucker. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. He is a clever fucker. He, um, for, uh, well, I was talking to him the other week and uh, he'd, he'd mentioned about this thing on Facebook. He'd had an argument with somebody, so I had a look. Um, you know, it is like the, the, the Paris program has been on some hats jumped on there, starts giving it all Billy big balls. Um, so a few of the blokes are just making him bite. You know, what the lads are like, shut yeah. up your dick. Yeah. You miss, you used to go out with a reg bloke. <laughs> and he's, <laughs> instead of just saying, so the bloke is going, you yeah, know, whatever, mate. Um, it's basically one of the blokes, he said, what the fuck have you done? So he sort of did this big long list of when he was in, regiment he was in, I think it's a PWRR or something. Oh, um, no. And then he's he's basically saying two MIDs, uh, first Iraq, second Iraq, going on. And he looks no book when I just thought, fair common if you've done that, you know, you've, you've done your time. Well, Billy won't let that lie, will he? So <laughs> I, I worry he gets his information from, I don't know. Um, there's obviously a website or he's got a contact somewhere. And literally you can see like, this comment was done 21 minutes ago, and then like 19 minutes, so three minutes after, Billy's come on, you lying fucker. This is when you joined, you weren't any good at boxing, you got to, because obviously everything's documented, isn't yeah. it? Um, you ain't got any, I think he said he got two mentioning dispatches and an MC or something. So Billy just blew him out the water, well, then the, all the lads are kind of just barking behind him, <laughs> and he just went for it, <laughs> you fucking creature. And then even he's like, the people that he, he served with just going, you've just completely embarrassed yourself in the regiment, mate. You're just complete bullshit. Yeah. And he didn't reply to anything. So obviously yeah. all the blokes are inboxing God. him then. Oh, you fucking well. <laughs> they yeah. phoned him back and says, mate, where do you get that information from? He just goes, you know me, hippo. You know me. <laughs> what do you think of the um, Men of War documentary? Paris documentary? Do you know what, mate? I think it's all right. Did you watch it uh, all? Yeah, I did, mate, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I've I, only seen I, the first episode. I haven't seen the second or third because I just wasn't able to, I, was, I missed them, but I wouldn't yeah. watch them. I mean, I, I, I watched them. Um, I did genuinely think they were good. I think the blokes come across, certainly the, the screws. Um, you know you've been out a bit when you don't even know the fucking screws, man. Um, oh, yeah. And I, I do genuinely think they came across well. Um, I think they got a bit of negative comments from the older guys. Um, and it's... I suppose what I'm trying to get at is the guys that were in maybe the seventies or even like the early nineties before our generation is they can, not all of them, but quite a few of them can be really negative. Fucking you, uh, Edgar's in P company. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? What well, you see easier in my day you used to get filled in. Well, Jones will still get filled in now, they but they're not going to film it. Are they? You, have you got to be stupid to even think that that's going to be on television? And they were quite vocal about it. (coughs) And I thought it were unfair. And I very nearly just got into some really sort of just mental conversations with them. Um, But I know a guy locally um, who's ex uh, two para. And he served sort of late 80s, early 90s. Dead nice bloke. I know a few actually local that served in that era. Dead nice bloke. Loves the reg through and through. Um, He actually actually got discharged. Um, He had something wrong with it. I can't remember what it was now. Um, and I mentioned it to him about it and he, he at the end he said the problem in my generation he says I'm, I'm not taking anything away from him they missed the Falklands so they got beasted and I'm not saying this about anyone it's not to offend anyone he says so we had Ireland he says alright Ireland was pretty tasty then he goes but it weren't Afghanistan he said it might have been Iraq because not much happened in Iraq for certainly when three power was there was it and all uh, afterwards lads were getting it with IDs quite a lot but there weren't many sort of fight or die scenarios Um and he goes, and they're the ones that are, and you have to go to the, some of the PRA meetings to see it. And because I, I went to one with him, and he went, Do you see what I mean? And he just hit the nail on the head. It's just almost like 
um, the the echo of a pub paratrooper. Not really done it, done a little bit. And then they're the ones, fucking P company, they're soft these days, they're soft now. And you just think, you know what? I don't think the training that it portrayed on TV, apart from the stuff that happens behind closed doors at night, at two o'clock in the morning, um, <laughs> when you respirate, run, <laughs> um, is, is any different than what you or I went through. Um, but I suppose the difference, well, I mean, obviously we, we went on plenty of ops. And we did what we did. And I do genuinely think the generation that are there now, and no, the screws that are in, there still speaks like people like Mike Firth and that. No, so, but time's no different. The, the guys are slightly different because they're the generation after us. Yeah. Um, so trends change, people change. But actually the model of how it's how it's done has never never changed. It's always been the same. You've still got the esprit de corps. You know, the blokes have still got loads of bottle about them. Um so yeah, I think overall I was like really happy with it. I thought it came across really well. I was. I watched the first episode and I, I, I was accidental. I wasn't going to watch it because I normally want to get the TV and throw out the fucking window. And anyway, yeah, yeah, like, I, yeah. I'm the same. Hundred percent. Why, why are you stressing stuff out? And it's not. And that's right or wrong. It's. it's, it's uh, and I, I'm aware of that because it's sort of. I'm aware that I'm naturally going to think bad things, and it could always be represented better because yeah. I, I feel so strongly about the regiment. Yeah. My time. You know and. Uh, I went to, remember Luke Hardy? I do, yeah. yeah. So when I got to London, the state is, and I went on there and he said, uh, you can stay at my, yeah, but I'm not there, my missus is there, and you're going to have to, which is Lucy, the producer of Kajaki. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Right, she have, and she wants to watch Prize Men of War. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to have to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So put it on, mate. And um, there wasn't one point where I thought, throw the fucking thing out the window. I think, <clears throat> I think, uh, I, I was also looking at it just from, just from knowing people in the TV and media industry and working with Kajaki yeah. and knowing Lucy, you know, having that perspective, that uh, more more knowledge of what they can and can't show and and how things are dramatised or not on TV. It was blatant, like the black lad who it was blatant in the first twenty minutes, yeah. like they, he's been set up to be a star on his show, yeah. kind of thing. However, way it comes about, yeah. Um, but I thought it was good, and you're right, it did come across well. Uh, I think they got the, the, the political reckless nailed in that they went to the, about the wire of what they could show. The only problem was when I saw in the, in the first episode <clears throat> was that they condensed a lot, a lot, of, a long time into three shows. You know, I think the first episode covers the first seven or eight weeks. <clears throat> and there was a point, I was watching it with Lucy and I was watching it with her friend who's also a TV producer, uh, first dates. All right, yeah. Yeah, right. All right, yeah. Well, her friend was the producer of Powers Men of War. Yeah. I'm trying to get the producer of Powers Men of War on you. Right, okay. Right. Well, brilliant. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know why I'm whispering it. <laughs> Hopefully she can hear it. I can't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we were sitting You're there, and it was, a, it was a bit where it was a platoon sergeant, and I think one, ah, uh, I think it was that, that South African lad who just fucking jacked. And uh, there's a bit where it, it looks a bit harsh when you see it on TV, and it? Your man, the potential man, he goes, well, you're just a fucking dick. You're just a fucking dick. Go on, fuck off. Just a fu-. That goes mental yeah. at him. It looks out of the blue. And but I, and you don't get a sense, like he doesn't say, for example, every five minutes, week two now, and then next five minutes, week three now. You know? yeah. So you don't understand. And I, I turned to Lucy and um, Sarah and said, just, he, he looks like a fucking knob there. But you have to bear in mind that he, those guys, that team, We've we'll been trying to get that guy on track for the last seven weeks. Yeah, last seven weeks they want people yeah. to succeed, and it's just that that screw. Uh, it was a screw up to his sergeant. He just lost his rag after yeah. fucking bangers out of his Oh, when he was put, yeah, putting the bullet in, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Go on in, yeah. fuck off. You know, it's, yeah. I can't. Remember, I can't remember what it was, but yeah. So yes, it was good. <clears throat> um, I heard some. I heard a couple of dodgy things about the third episode. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. A bit embarrassing, really. But and, uh, uh, and we know the pair of them, don't we? we yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but I, I, I do think that the because uh, you know, remember Steve Bridgman? Mm-hmm. Um, he's doing something. Well, some, doing something with he drives a general or something, doesn't he? And he know, rang me up. Sorry, didn't interrupt you. He rang me up, mate. You know, you think you are having me on. He, I was on as guard commander at Hyderabad Barracks in God, I don't know two thousand and it would have been two thousand and um, five, two thousand six. I think <clears throat> no, two thousand five. End of two thousand five. And he phone goes in the guard room. We go um, uh, third battalion parachute agent, corporate care speaker, sir. And he says, uh, "Hugh, it's uh, Steve." And Steve, to my knowledge, he ended up the CO's driver with three para, right? Yeah. Bluffer of bluffers. <laughs> right? CO's driver with three para. 
and then not that that's a bluffer job, but he went from he basically stayed there forever and then disappeared. He disappeared, right? Yeah, went to so brigade, didn't he? He said, What are you up to now, mate? He said, Oh, I'm um I'm such and such over at Shape. Shape? What shape? He said, uh, Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Powers of Europe. And fuck off. You just made that up. You just made that up. <laughs> Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Powers of Europe. It's like something you're in, like, in the Second World War, mate. He goes, no, what are you on about? Everyone knows about shape. <laughs> you talking shit? <laughs> shape? Have you ever heard of shape? No, shape no, this. No. <laughs> yeah, shape this. Hang up. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so carry on. <laughs> what were you on about? I can't remember. Oh, oh no, so he's put... Um, he put like a statement on from, I believe, from the CO. No, it was Lorimer. Oh, was it Lorimer? Yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, you know the big mega one that says, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and he, I felt as though he, it was great that he made a statement, but I felt as though he didn't need to do it because he, he was sort of addressing negative comments. And I've not seen that many. I've, uh, you've seen, you have your your element that think they know everything, um, and you're always going to have some negativity, but you're almost like just think fucking else. So you didn't need to do that. Oh, hang on, I might see a different one. What I saw was he, it was a it was um, an internal comms, not internal. It was, it was communication to the PRAs and um, and basically, you know, power edge stakeholders saying what he thought of it. And at the end, yes, it's got the bits that were regret- regrettable and maybe could not have been shown. Like we spoke in, just really so yeah. minor. It was so minor, and then... Yeah, maybe I've just read it a little bit different to you. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Might, it's, yeah. It sounds like yeah. a very similar yeah. one. It's just right, like yeah. in the sort of the first paragraph, um, he was sort of saying why are you allowed to do it, and oh, he okay. appreciates that there's been some negative oh, comments right, yeah, as well yeah, as yeah, positive. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I read it, I thought, you know what, you don't... Fucking brigade commander doesn't have to do that, whatever job he's doing now. Mm. You know, no one has to... At the end of the day, they invited the TV studios in. It come from MOD, didn't it? it didn't, it's not a, a brigade-level um, decision, I shouldn't imagine, that a TV show, a show can, so, can air. Um, well, yeah, I enjoyed it. I did, mate. I, I, do, I think, I mean, in fact, you mentioned that statement. It's like it'd be good for the Power Edge recruitment and, and, and army recruitment on a wider scale, and I 100% think so. Yeah. I think it's bang on what was, ne- bang on what, what was needed. Um, oh, no, not what was needed. But it's 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 definitely a positive thing that is welcome at, at the moment where recruitment's hard, retention's hard. It's fucking. I mean, it painted it painted the training out whether you consider to be power edge or not to not be easy. They don't give yeah. a fuck. You know, uh, uh, you're gonna get thrashed and you're gonna get fucked off. You're gonna spoke to this shit. You're gonna. It's hard work and and and. And you know whether they're power edge or not, I do think it'll draw more people. It's good. Yeah, it's got to be good. Is, yeah, it's conditioning, isn't it? And. I think if people go, uh, certainly young lads now, when they think, fuck it, I'm going to go for the Reds, they've got a little bit of an idea what to expect when they start. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, 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 a little bit. They, of a, yeah. Like they never showed, the, like you're saying, they never showed the evening times in the yeah. night after dark. Yeah. I remember a certain, uh, I remember a certain a friend of ours with a, a head that is not yeah. unlike um, a fish similar to a haddock. Mm, yes. A similar size to an engine, yeah. maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Had, had you could call him Haddock Head, but he was not called Haddock Head. He had a different name, something Head, similar to a Haddock, but not Haddock. And uh, and uh, when he 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 went into uh, he went into uh, lash damp, <laughs> screw that out depot, goes in, decides to pop smoke in the block. <laughs> Bop the smoke grenade in the block. Mega. Is this all right? It kills people. <laughs> <laughs> Since suffocation. Yeah, Just how are you going? Br- breathe, breathe it in, Joe. <laughs> breathe it in. <laughs> Suck it out, Joe. <laughs> you get your lips on the end. There you go, start wrapping it up. Um, right. Ooh, how? Right. Yeah, business. How do, what's your fucking business, mate? What's it called? Um, Where do you want to point people to? Shameless plug now. Who do you want to mention? Organisations? Well, whatever. Up to you. Um, well, we've got the we have the uh, investment business, Pegasus Investment Group. Um, to be fair, it, it don't really plug into the blokes. It's just sort of, and then not, uh, unless the landlords. Blokes, not just the blokes are listening. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then obviously we've got the, the furniture business, which um, we supply sort of nationwide. Right, so really. I don't, yeah, uh, yeah. What's your furniture business called? Landlord Furniture. Company. What's the What's the website? Uh, fucking hell. We've just changed it. Uh, www.landlordfurnitureco.co.uk What's the other business? Um, it's pegasus-investments.co.uk 
What's the website? Oh, that's the website. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell cool. you what we do do though. Have, have you seen the military chairs we've been do, doing? Do 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 do. Military. Um, a military chair is like a, a wing back sort of ah, chair. Ah, he's going to ask you about this, yeah. yeah. Yeah, do you know what? I never plug it. And then, so it gets to October time, I thought, oh, I'll just do a Facebook ad. I'll spend 30 quid on it. Could do could do some money for Christmas. <laughs> and then fucking hell, they all come in, all, all the pads wives are like, can you do my husband one? Um, so yeah, we do like basically like uh, embroidered chairs for man cares, really. And then we stick the cat badge in the back. Yeah. Billy Jen's got one. Um, quite a few other blokes have got them, actually. Um... So yeah, that's all right. That's just uh, some Facebook like military chairs. You just turn on; they're all pirate reg chairs. And I think we've done a well, we've done a guards chair as well. Um, we can do any regiment, obviously. But have you seen the ones with, made out of number twos? With the medals on? That's far too much work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They get like slagging as well. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a bit too far. It's um, at least the ones that we do. They're quite subtle. It, you know, you can have it in your front room, and yeah. people just sort of walk past, nice, and then yeah. the cat badge is sort cat of subdued wish. in the back. Yeah. Um, I've not got one. We haven't got a mansion. Have you not? Yet. I've got. I tell you, I've got one in my office. All oh, right. Um, what little lad just because little lad comes in in the office one and a half days a week because Lisa works with us full time now. Um, he just climbs and draws all over it. So it's just a it's just a bag of shit in the corner now <laughs> <laughs> with all these toys on it. <laughs> That's it, mate. Sweet. Thank right. you. All the best for the future. Thank you. And you come back on any time you want. Yeah, tomorrow. Not that soon. <laughs> <laughs>